So please join me in welcoming Luis Fernandez. deforestation in the Amazon, particularly in the western Amazon on the boundary between the Amazon and the Andes. So just to, to give you a sense of where we are going to be talking about, uh, this is uh, uh, an area that is in the southern part of Peru uh, on the western side of the and, uh, Amazon. And this is close to the triple border between Peru, uh, Bolivia, and Brazil. And it's an area around the size of Costa Rica. So it's not a small region. Um, and it's primarily rainforest. And it's a very special rainforest. It's actually uh, some of the most biodiverse rainforest on the planet. This is Manu National Park. Uh, it's very famous. It's been in a lot of, kind of Discovery uh, Channel specials. And just last year in science, it was identified as the uh, particular spot that has the highest biodiversity uh, across many taxa. Uh, that's been studied to date. Uh, so this is an area that is uh, also was recently um, changed by a very large road that was built um, by international development banks that connect Brazil to the coast. And that's important because Brazil has a lot of products and they want to send it to China. Um, and this is a, and the Andes have always been a barrier for large producers such as Brazil and, and other countries, Argentina in the south. And over the last 15 years, there's been a very large infrastructure improvement project that's funded by the IDB for a series of roads crisscrossing the continent, connecting the oceans through a series of, uh, of roads that can handle the traffic for, for large trucks, for containers that would then go to the ports, that would go to the markets, either uh, on the Atlantic side to Europe or uh, on the Pacific side, mainly to China and Southeast Asia and Korea. Um, so that's kind of the scene center. But let me give you something that shows you what I see when I go down there. Uh, and this is what I see usually when I go to my field sites. I work in uh, both uh, urban areas, but mainly in very remote areas. This is an area that's not very developed. It's the size of Costa Rica, but only has about 100,000 people. Um, and it's still pristine forest. It's a very beautiful place, lots of birds. They have giant river otters, which are nine feet long. It's, it's a pretty spectacular place. Uh, and then if you fly over there, and the only way to get there really is to take a very small plane, lots of eco lodges starting to pop up, you see uh, this. And it's unbroken forest with those slow meandering tropical rivers. Um, but more recently, we're seeing this. This is a video shot by the Carnegie Airborne Observatory. And this is the same area that that previous picture was. And what you're seeing here is deforestation resulting from gold mining. And we're looking at areas that are totaling more than 60,000 hectares. We actually, uh, there was a, uh, a publication that came out uh, that had the number at 50,000. That was last year. And it's expanding very rapidly. And most of this was actually done in three or four years. So these, what you see here, which these long scars, are pits that result from gold mining and used to follow the line of a small creek in the center of it. And then as people invaded the area and started to work the area, those mines started to expand from the center and then creating these long linear features. And some of these features are 15, 20 kilometers long. There are several of them. And you can just follow, you know, there's a creek here. This is on the river bank. Um, and everything's starting to fill up with mud. So it creates a very different landscape in a very, very short number, uh, amount of time. And with, just as an aside, this is an aircraft used for research. This is just a wing cam. We're not using any super fancy uh, cameras for, for this particular video. But I'll talk a little bit more about what instruments we can use. So, this is a Landsat satellite image from 2003. 
And here's the road I was talking to you about. It's called the Interoceanic Highway. Um, and there is the Inambari, which is one of the, um, the rivers that connect to the mother, the Yosef River, which is one of the major tributaries of the Amazon. Uh, and this road still isn't, it's not completely paved. It's still pretty much dirt road at this point. But in just a few years, there's a big difference. And again, this linear feature is a small creek, which is called Wakamayo. Uh, and this is, you know, about two kilometers wide and 20 some odd, 25 kilometers long. And there's lots of these. Yes. How's that? Okay. That's, that's good. We want to be able to see the elements of both. Uh, well, um, so this is what it looks like when you're on the ground. It is pretty much complete devastation. We're not talking about just clear-cutting forests and, and maintaining soils. We're mining the ground down, in some cases, 10 meters, removing all the organic material and processing it to extract the gold in the sediments at the bottom of rivers and in riverbanks, in floodplains. And a little closer up, this is what those pits look like, those little ponds that, that were clustered together in those linear features where people doing extremely difficult work are effectively liquefying the soil, putting it through a process, and, re and the result is this little ball of what is a mixture of mercury and gold. And to get that amount, um, they had to process about 10 tons of soil or sediment to get that amount of gold, which is roughly 50-50 gold and mercury. Um, and it's used in a very, very primitive way, technologically speaking. The same way of doing uh, this process uh, as was done 500 years ago during the Spanish uh, colonial period and 1,000 years ago in different parts of the world uh, and even the Roman Empire. And that is a handful of mercury. And if you know anything about mercury, that's not something you want to be doing because, you know, nowadays if you break a thermometer in a school, They'll call the, the fire department and close off the, the, the building, and people with spacesuits will go in and, and remove the tiny uh, few grams that are on the ground. This is probably about 100 grams of mercury in this hand. And it's very commonly available. This is, you know, a box of mercury. This is uh, probably, it's going to be 12 kilos of mercury. Um, it's interesting, it's actually illegal, but they make it look really legal. They even give you a phone number, it's got a registry number, uh, it's got a nice logo, but it doesn't connect to anything. It just gives you the appearance of, of legality. So just to go over some of the details about artisanal gold mining, it's not something that doesn't exist, or it used to happen in the 49er days, like, they did, like it did here in California. Artisanal gold mining is uh, approximately 20% of today's gold production, and it uses mercury amalgamation. It's the largest source of mercury emissions to the environment today. Roughly 40% of the mercury is not from uh, coal-fired power plants. Uh, it's, it's greater than industrial uses. It's gold mining. Um, that number has increased because of the price of gold has skyrocketed in the last years. It went up from 200, roughly $200 about 10 years ago to close to $2,000 in, in recent years. Right, right now it's around $1,400, $1,500. But it spurred a, a uh, worldwide gold boom that we see in over 70 countries involving millions of people, either directly working in the area or affected by its, uh, by its force. Um, and these current numbers are, uh, these numbers are uh, underestimates. It's considered because of the illegality or the remoteness of the nature. Mainly poor people are doing this. Poor people in developing countries. We're not talking about big companies. That's another talk. Uh, these are people that leave other, other activities like agriculture, work in the mines for a certain number of, uh, a 
a certain period and then go back. Very similar to the way it was here in California in the 1840s and 50s and 60s. So why is it used? <clears throat> because it works really well and it's really simple. It has an unusual characteristic of amalgamating with gold, of blending into gold. Uh, and I'll go into how it actually does that. But basically, it allows you to be more efficient. Remember that little ball in that person's hand? I said that you need tons and tons of sediments to do that. If you just go with a pan, like you see in those cartoons of what gold miners did 150 years ago, you would be there for a very long time to get, to go through those 10 tons of soil. Um, there is a very simple process by basically taking a concentrate and adding mercury. And the mercury will, the gold will stick to the mercury and form kind of a putty, forming the amalgam. It's the same thing that's in, for some people that still have mercury, I mean mercury in their teeth, they use mercury amalgams for filling. It's the same thing, except that it uses silver. And there are a few metals that do amalgamate, silver, gold, and platinum, and other ones do amal uh, amalgamate. Um, it's a preferred method of these miners because it's cheap, it's effective, and it's generally available through either poorly controlled markets or illegal markets. And there are a few uh, alternatives because large companies use cyanide. And cyanide is, uh, requires uh, a, a lot of training, so basically you don't kill yourself. Um, so how is it used? Very simply speaking, you've got gold in sand. There's not a lot of gold, and there's a lot of sand. And you use it to dissolve the mercury in these areas. So you separate the tailings, which is basically the sand of the sediment, and you add the amalgam. And it's roughly 50-50. And then you would burn it with a simple blowtorch, and then you have your gold. I, mean, I can teach you how to be a gold miner in five minutes. It's really easy. Right? And you know there are some TV shows on cable channels of guys going back to the Yukon or going to the American River and, and doing it, right? Uh, it's not a good idea, but you know, it makes for a cable show, I guess. Um, so it's, it's something that people can pick up on the fly and earn hundreds of times what they would earn being a farmer or working in, a, in, a, uh, in uh, manufacturing, being poorly paid in many countries. So we're talking about rural releases and exposure. These are people actually doing the process I described in the Madre de Dios River, in the Guacamayo, that, that zone I showed you with the videos, um, to get this amalgam ball. Literally, it's just putting it through a t-shirt, squeezing it like a lemon. Um, then you burn it off, and this is just a little can of, of gasoline and a foot pump, and then now you have your blowtorch and you just burn it off. No protection, no idea about uh, what happens to that mercury. It just boils off like a smoke. It's also urban release. Um, that were, the previous pictures were in the field, but people go to sell their gold, and they sell it in someone who's got a, a scale and a blowtorch with a little hood. And down the street, you see hundreds of these shops. And this is a place that's roughly at about 15,000 feet above sea level in the Peruvian Andes, about 350 gold shops, because it's right on a, uh, next to a mountain that people are basically pulling out the gold. Um, but Obviously, there's, there's problems with the understanding that mercury is toxic because if you see this hood, there's no chimney, right? It just ends, and then the mercury is just in the air, it sticks to the wall. Why even have a hood? I'm not sure. But this is the way that it's done. And in this case, if you can see it's a little, little light, the little pipe actually points at the person that's selling the gold. Not a good idea. Uh, and that's, by, that's a kilo of mercury in that person's hand and a half pounds, roughly. OK, mercury is toxic in all of its forms. Why? Significant health impacts on, on mammals, humans, herps, birds, across the board. It has an unusual or a, a unique ability to bioaccumulate and biomagnify in food chains, in ecosystems, and it's extraordinarily persistent in the environment. It doesn't break down. It's an element. So it's not like. For example, cyanide. Cyanide is very toxic, but breaks down with UV light in a day or two. It won't break down, and it lasts a long time. So some of the effects on human health, permanent damage to central nervous system, especially women, in, I mean, infants and children, because their systems are developing. They're uh, considered uh, 10 times more susceptible, vulnerable to the effects as uh, adults. 
effects include those uh, for intelligence, coordination, vision, muscular control, aggressiveness, across the board. It affects the, the central nervous system. Also, genetic and immunological damages, and it's transferred through the placental barrier to the fetuses, uh, which is why it's so uh, uh, many of the most uh, vulnerable groups are women that are pregnant because of the effects on the children. Uh, and the consumption of contaminated fish is the, is the primary pathway. This is a very famous picture that's in the National Archives uh, as a result of a major methylmercury uh, exposure event in Minamata, Japan in the 50s. It gave the name to the new UN Minamata Convention, which controls mercury. It was signed last year. Um, and it's, uh, it, many people died. Uh, and it was, it was because there was a factory that was putting mercury into the bay, it concentrated into the fish. And the people started to realize that there was something going on because the cats were starting to die and have horrible deformations. And then the children started to be born with deformations. This was on the high end of exposure. Um, uh, there are still people in a, very, in a specialized facility in Japan that are they're living out their lives on, uh, in, a, in a hospital paid by the government and by the settlement they had with that with this factory, but there is uh, a lot more people being exposed at lower levels, and we're going to be talking about that soon. So why is it a problem in the environment? Well, it, bi it, it bioaccumulates. And this is actually pretty easy to understand because, you know, you have little fish, and little fish during their lifetimes consume this, and the, uh, the rate of uh, exposure is greater than the natural rate of elimination in the organism. So the older fish generally have more mercury because it just accumulates. But what's less obvious is the biomagnification. And that relates to food chains. So it actually, so this is one for the marine system. These are little shrimp or krill. You have small, uh, small fish. That's supposed to be a walrus and a polar bear. Every time it goes up a trophic level or a link in the food chain, it magnifies. And this magnification process is extremely efficient. So in the case of the Amazon, uh, the top level fish, basically uh, the equivalent of the tuna of an Amazonian river, if you want to think about it this way, has levels tens of millions of times higher than the water in which those fish swim in. So where you are in the trophic level is extraordinarily important for understanding what your what the effects are for that organism and for the organism that's going to eat that one. And this makes, uh, and this is important uh, when you combine them because you have both effects and it, uh, and you can kind of think about how this works in the following way. So you have mercury enters the system by being uh, dumped uh, either directly because of mining practices or it rains out because uh, there are some forms of mercury that are soluble in water and then uh, if you burn it, it gets into the atmosphere, it turns into an oxidized form, and then it rains out, and in certain areas, it's very rainy, gets into the water, gets to the bottom, and is converted by na naturally by bacteria to methylmercury. Methylmercury is the organic form, and this is a really dangerous one because it, it gets concentrated, uh, uh, I mean, it, it crosses the barrier mainly into plants and phytoplankton, which then gets into the base of the food chain and starts to go up. So every time it goes up, it starts to concentrate, and it starts to accumulate. Bigger and bigger, it gets biomagnified until somebody gets that fish and eats it and magnifies again. And methylmercury absorbs at a very high rate. 80, uh, 99% and 98% is absorbed. So whatever you're going to eat is going to be uh, incorporated. So that's, I wanted to give you that like a quick primer about, uh, about the, the system. And now a little bit about what we're doing in the area to understand um, the dynamics of mercury uh, in the region. Um, mercury's been around, the issue has been around since the 50s when it was identified through the Minamata Convention, I mean, through the Minamata episode. But in the tropics, it's poorly understood because um, the chemistry is different, the, uh, the food chains are different. Uh, and it is much more uh, connected to environmental degradation and social problems. So it's a very interesting uh, system because there's, a, there's so many aspects to it. Um, so what we wanted to do is develop a broad baseline study of the effects both on natural and human systems related from 
uh, related to gold mining in the region because it was really starting to, to, to take off. Um, so we wanted to know about the deforestation, where's the mining happening with deforestation rates, the impacts on aquatic ecosystems by taking a look at the fish, uh, the mercury levels in the humans, because there's a very interesting range of populations. And then if we could actually tease out what fraction of the mercury is, absorb, uh, is observed coming from, uh, from gold mining or the stuff that's coming naturally from the soils, because mercury is a relatively common element and it actually does weather out in some soils. And we want to see if we can separate those out by some novel techniques. Okay, so where's the mining happening? We had some ideas. There was a study that was done. It was really it was just a student study. This was the extent of it um, that, that indicated basically by looking outside of planes where the, the mining was and doing some quick analysis. We wanted to do something much more specific because uh, the effects that we were seeing didn't really add up to the numbers that were coming out of uh, the, the ministries and, and other sources. So by using two tools, two relatively new tools to explore, uh, to explore this, one is a uh, satellite analysis system, uh, some software, it's class light, it's the Carnegie Land Analysis System light because we can run it on PCs and not on big supercomputers. It gives you a sub-pixel analysis uh, of freely available software, I mean, uh, freely available um, imagery, Landsat, to be able to do uh, the analysis. Uh, and by using uh, the Carnegie Airborne Observatory, using LIDAR and hyperspectral scanners that give very, very fine resolution um, to be able to see the stuff that we could not see from the satellite uh, imagery. Because the satellite has a 30 by 30 meter pixel and we didn't want to lose what's beneath that, the sub-pixel uh, dynamics. The class lights helps estimate what's happening below that pixel limit, but to be able to get very fine resolution stuff, we, are, we used the Carnegie uh, Airborne Observatory. So these are uh, false color images of different areas, and it allows us to get a really rich typology of what's there. So it's not just the mining sites, the, the, the the boundaries between rural areas and urban areas, and then what kind of damages are happening in the, in the mining sites. And it allows us also to detect things that are very difficult to see with regular photographs or regular images. So this is one that's just false color. It's a regular one. We see the trees, but by combining some of the data layers that we get or subtracting them, we can actually see the mining sites by stripping out the trees because we have LIDAR and, and we actually are looking at bare soil and the changes in the level of the bare soil and the reflectiveness. Because now those, those are basically water ponds that are associated with that, with that mining. So it allowed us to, to see much more. So just as an example, this is some of the results, uh, kind of one of the raw layers over Google Earth. And then if we blow up in this particular area, you can see that there's a lot of little stuff that was missed in previous uh, analyses. And you know, we didn't know how important these little, little bits are because you know, it's not large companies. You know, it's easy to see those giant streaks of deforestation like I showed you in that video. It's much harder to see this because this is prime rainforest. You know, tall trees, very dense vegetation, very hard to get to. There's no roads there. Um, so when we add it all up, this was the previous estimate from another study we find that it's a lot more. All those little pieces add up to a tremendous amount. So we could say this, is, this came out in uh, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences last year, uh, PNAS, that mining is the primary driver of deforestation after 2007. And if you remember what happened in 2007, the price of gold skyrocketed because of the, of the crisis, uh, the, the big economic crash. So it's not just bunch of miners deciding on their own to go into these areas. It's connected to global economic systems far away. And it's having impact right on the ground. Um, so we also wanted to take a look at the mercury issue. What is, a, what is going on? Who's being affected? So uh, we started the Carnegie Amazon Mercury Ecosystem Project, um, working with 10 universities uh, here in the States and in Peru, and different NGOs 
to be able to, to go into areas that no one or few people have gone before. Uh, we just didn't want to do the remotely sensed view because what we can see, even with our sensors, is just what's happening to the landscape. Mercury is the silent, or the, I should say the invisible effects because it, uh, it contaminates ecosystems, so it affects not only humans, but animals as simple as fish all the way up to mammals. Uh, and it persists for many, many, many years. And I'll talk about how long that might uh, last as well coming up. So we went to urban communities, rural communities. We uh, uh, wanted to work with indigenous communities. And this is a part of the world that still has uncontacted tribes, people that are not integrated into the global system. Very few places in the world still have people that are not part of our modern world. Uh, it's, a, it's an area the size of Delaware, yet it is surrounded by gold mining. And there is some, you know, the, the monitoring is very scant there because it's supposed to be areas in isolation. There's kind of a, a preserve for those folks. Um, but there is a lot of intrusions and there's a lot of discussion by tribes around there that there are people going in and having conflict because they, they see this as kind of a refuge from, from authorities that they can go in there because the, you know, the, the cops can't go behind them and get them out. Um, but let's go on. So what we're trying to do is, what we, we want to do is measure the mercury levels in fish, which is an indicator of the accumulation of mercury in these ecosystems. Uh, mercury levels in human hair, and we're using hair because it is the biomarker for, bio, for methylmercury. Practically all the mercury in your hair is methylmercury. If, I were, if you wanted to study elemental mercury, which is a type of mercury that you would uh, be exposed to if you're breathing mercury, you would use urine. So it's actually kind of nice that it separates, it separates out nicely. Um, blood is a little more complex because it integrates different types of mercury. Um, and that allows you to, to figure out what kind of exposure you have. So we're using hair. Um, it's an indicator of the impacts of the human population that can consume fish, which is an indicator of how humans connect to the ecosystem. Is that interrelationship. So um, we did a pilot study in 2009. Got a lot of fish. Um, this is a, a sungaru or a, a tiger cerebim. Uh, a lot of catfish there. A lot of them very big. And we set up a, uh, a portable mercury analysis lab in the local university um, and tried not to eat too much fish while we were doing the analysis. It's very tasty, uh, I'm afraid. Um, and what we found in 2009 is that four of the 11 species that were sold in the markets in Mar de Dios had levels above the, w, uh, the, the EPA um, methylmercury fish limit, the, the RFC, the reference concentration, that's what it's called. Um, and this was concerning. And actually, when we uh, released these, uh, these data in 2009 and 2010, we did this at the end of 2009, it hit the front page. People were surprised because people didn't have any data. They assumed it was anecdotal information, but actually this kicked off a fair amount of interest. Uh, and this study was actually quite small. It was literally just buying fish in the market. You know, it, wasn't, it wasn't a very extensive study. Um, but we went back in uh, 2012 and started a larger project where instead of just buying fish from the market, we worked in eight watersheds, 42 sampling sites, uh, with 42 species of fish. We, you know, that was enough to give us an indication that there was something there. And then now we're doing something at large scale. So when we did start to do these analyses, we actually found a much more e extensive picture. So many more species um, are affected, 60% of, uh, of the fish uh, are uh, above the EPA RFC. Um, we're still actually analyzing some of the watersheds, so we have more data. These are preliminary uh, information. These are the ones that are basically sold in, uh, in the markets uh, for human consumption by city dwellers. But of course, indigenous people eat a lot more than just the 5 or 10, 15 fish that you have in the market. So uh, we have more, more uh, work in process for for really understanding this and, and getting the sense of how it's spatially distributed through the region, uh, and especially the story about migration. 
um, migratory, uh, most of the feeling is uh, that m most of the effects are related to downstream uh, location. Like if you're downstream from a mine, you have a problem. That's not necessarily so because 70% of the, of the fish are highly migratory, especially many of the big catfish, which they, have, they range up to 1,500 kilometers. Some of them will go down all the way down to the middle of Brazil and then come back up. And they have this tendency of going up and down different watersheds. So if you, you know, are exposed in one watershed and then the fish goes down and then goes back another one because in their life cycle they like to eat different things and they, they range, uh, and you eat that fish, you're exposed. So there it's, uh, the footprint is going to be bigger. We're actually trying to map that out. We're working, we have a collaborator from the, uh, nat the Museum of Natural History of Peru, who is the world's authority on uh, migratory uh, Amazonian catfish in this part of the world, uh, which uh, is key to understand who's being, who's being exposed where. Uh, unsurprisingly, the fish uh, that are high trophic level are the ones with the highest concentrations, um, but they're also the ones that are the most consumed. And the ones from fish farms are, very, are relatively low, relatively. Um, and this is something that we saw was a kind of an interesting aside, that people, after the first study, saw that we also found low levels in fish farms. Fish farms took off, and they started to sell the fish as low mercury fish. And they're the same fish that are wild, but then they put them in ponds. Some of them were former mining ponds. We're still trying to figure out if that's a good idea or not. Um, and then they sell them as low mercury fish. And people really have started buying those because of the concerns that are starting to come out. Um, and it's actually been a large enough economic driver that there is now a lot of cheating. There are some, there's only three species of fish you can actually sell uh, because they, they, uh, you can put in um, fish farms because they do pretty well. A lot of other fish just don't do good in fish farms. Um, so they take these fish that are, that you can't grow in fish farms, but they say that they're farmed fish. So for example, those big catfish, you, there's no way to actually uh, raise them in fish farms. So people say like, these are low mercury fish, farmed fish, and they charge you an extra 10%. So it actually shows that it's an economic, it, it shows two things. One, there's an economic uh, dynamic going on, but also it shows that the consumers are concerned and they're paying extra for being told. much lower. So the ones in Japan were about two orders of magnitude higher. But that's pretty much the top end. There were, yeah, about 200 ppm. Um, between 140 and 200 ppm. And that's where roughly about 2,000 people died. It, immediately, there were many deaths over the, the next 40 years. Um, so that's the ex acute exposure. Um, we're talking about something much lower. Um, so uh, there are, these are the, the means with the, with the errors. There are some fish that are as high as 10. Uh, the top fish that we measure about 12 ppm in these areas. So it's, it's quite a lot high, uh, quite a lot lower, but uh, much higher than the 0 0.3 ppm reference limit. Comparing the, the, the means of fish of the 11 species we measured in 2009 and 2012, uh, you can't really see these very well, but just look at the arrows. Practically all of them went up, uh, and we interpret that as the, the rivers being more saturated, more exposed to higher levels of mercury, being incorporated into the, uh, into the fabric of the ecosystem. So we're getting a lot more. And if you take a look at these numbers, they're quite a lot more in some cases, right? They go up, you know, uh, an order of magnitude, 100 times higher, 10 times higher, 100 times higher, depending on the species. Um, we also wanted to see what's going on with people. And this was a big question, a lot of interest, because uh, it, especially if, for affecting policy, people are concerned when you talk about fish. They're much more concerned when you talk about people. So with 24 communities, which represents practically every community in Maya Dios, except for a few indigenous communities uh, that we could not get to because they were uh, a little too remote. Um, about a little over 1,100 people, which represents about uh, uh, one and a half percent of the population of the entire state. Um, 
and uh, 10 native communities, which are very, very difficult to recruit. But there, has, there was enough concern by some of these communities that they were at risk that they allowed us to go in. And you know, it, it was, uh, some of these communities only had 50, 60 people in them. So we, again, sampled fish from the markets, as I mentioned. We went to these aquaculture ponds. But then we went, and uh, that's not urban, actually. It's everyone. That's a complete sample. Uh, it turned out we had about a little over 1,000 uh, uh, valid samples. And we, had a, we conducted a survey with everybody that we took a hair sample with. And that was uh, fish consumption, uh, whether or not you work in mining, how long have you lived there, basic dem demographic information, how old are you, uh, are you pregnant, uh, are you breastfeeding if it's, uh, for women, uh, et cetera. Um, something very quick because they're very, uh, you know, these are people that are not really uh, extraordinarily well educated and in going to mining communities, many miners, miners did not want to participate because they were afraid that they would be thought to be collaborators against environmentalists or, or government people or health officials that would like to ban mining. So it was actually very challenging. We were thrown out of some communities. We were threatened in, in, in one case that we had to leave town, uh, literally. It was like, we don't like the look of you guys. So it was, uh, we just packed up and left. Um, so this is kind of a contentious area. But what we found was very surprising. 76% of the population had mercury levels above the WHO limit of one part per million. Um, the highest uh, individual had 35 times the limit, 35 parts per million. It wasn't the difference between the men and women, um, but it was uh, something that uh, was, the, was not really expected to be this high. All the communities we took measurements in had uh, levels above the, the RFC. There was nothing that was below. There were some that were more uh, affected, and then we can see what the difference is. But the, the mean for the entire population was three parts per million. That's a, that's a very high mean. Um, it puts it in a, in a category that's above most countries and regions that don't have very high industrial exposure. There are only four urban centers in, my, in uh, uh, sorry, population centers in the Amazon that high, have high uh, levels this high that are not very small indigenous communities. And as we'll see, that there is a big difference in who is being exposed. Rural communities, mainly a rural issue. Um, rural communities had levels twice uh, Four times the reference standard and twice that of the urban communities. Here you see the, the ones in orange are the, are the uh, rural communities. But the indigenous communities were the ones that, are, that were really the, the ones that are most affected. Uh, five times uh, the standard, two and a half times those that are not indigenous. Seven of the ten communities most with the highest levels, most contaminated, uh, were uh, indigenous communities. And we see that the children, overall, the entire sample, 65% of the children in Manadios have levels above uh, the reference limit with very high levels, uh, in some cases, over 20 uh, parts per million. And the children of indigenous communities, on that graph on the bottom, are much, much higher than children in other areas. So there is a big difference uh, in how this is affecting it, and it actually uh, is related to a lot of questions of, eco, of uh, environmental justice as well. Uh, many of the communities are starting to get organized or have become organized in, in their processes to define their territories. And they're very concerned when this came out. This was, uh, again, got in the papers, the big thing. And they are preparing a, uh, a lawsuit against the Peruvian state on behalf of some of the indigenous communities uh, for in the International Human Rights Court to, uh, to make the case that the state of Peru has not protected the integrity of their borders uh, because this is an illegal activity and Peru has not stopped this and is allowing these communities to be affected and some of this is the, the information that they're using. Um, but to really nail down, you know, before we, we say that mining is the, is the root of all evil, 
related to, to mercury, we need to know what the background is. Because there is mercury in the soils, and some soils are quite high. And there were a series of studies uh, in, the, in the 90s that showed some parts of the Amazon as well have high levels of mercury and that they were confounding them with, with mining. And this was not in this part of the Amazon. This is in the central Amazon. Uh, but we needed to do that. Um, so we're starting a, a project uh, or a study with the University of Toronto and uh, uh, University of Southern California to do this. And we want to differentiate between that mining from uh, the mercury from mining and the local background. We want to know what the background is because we don't really know what that background is for the Andes region. And we want to link this new studies that are going up and kind of a network to get a good sense of what that, that boundary uh, limit is. Because it makes, uh, it's very important to be able to calibrate studies uh, because mining exists all throughout the Amazon. So we have to know what's going on in the headwaters and figuring out uh, what's going on at, at each point in the, in the watershed. And of course, the Amazon watershed is massive. So uh, we wanted to get that uh, information. We're using stable isotope analysis mercury species. Basically, it allows you to uh, to use isotopic ratios. There are several isotopes of, of, uh, of mercury. And it allows almost using uh, a fingerprint approach, it's a tracer. Um, different origins have different isotopic ratios. How it's treated modifies that a little bit as well. But you can discern mercury that comes from the Andes, basically the stuff in the soil, as different from the mercury that comes out of a bottle that's sold, because most of that is commodity mercury that comes from either Spain, in the mines in Almaden, or Kazakhstan, which is the second largest mine. The mine in Almaden is closed now, because there was a, a ban by the EU a couple years ago. The one in Kazakhstan is still operating-ish. It's not supposed to, but it seems it's still producing. Um, so you can figure out what is commodity mercury and what's local mercury. So part of our job is to actually calibrate that. This is a map of just an area that uh, we took a few samples. This was kind of a proof of concept because we're now developing this. And uh, a little hard to see, but what basically we're doing is that the mining is up here. So in these sites, by the river, we assume that there is uh, sediment that has lots of mercury that is associated with mining. And then there are areas that are not in the floodplain zone that are, is the natural soil background. And we wanted to see if we could separate them out. And we found that we could. This is, you know, this is the stuff that comes from the mercury uh, from the mining area. And this is the native mercury. So we haven't been able to measure them definitively, but we have now a pretty good method to figure this out. And what's important about this is not just for soils. We'll be able to do this for hair, for muscle tissue, in fish, for anything. Because it's just the mercury species, not the thing that it's in, that's important. So this is uh, something that we're pretty excited about because it allows us really using this as a biomarker. And it's used a lot in, in bio, in bio uh, to figure out what's going on with different things, carbon and nitrogen. Uh, and we're uh, hopeful that we can do this. A couple more slides uh, before I end. The idea of empowering people with the information they, they can receive. This is uh, an example of the, of the info sheet we gave back to people. There was more than 1,000 people that were in our study. And most people had no idea was, that mercury is bad, that it's affecting them. If they were minors, they had some idea that it's bad and that they're being exposed. But the, you know, the levels of, peop of mercury and people in cities eating fish, lawyers, shopkeepers, whatever, were many times higher than minors because they're eating the fish. The exposure is mainly through fish consumption because of methylmercury much more toxic than it is even by handling mercury in your hands, like that first picture. Um, but what happens often is that researchers like myself or somebody else goes there, takes somebody's hair, does something, does the analysis, never goes back. This is a big problem. And I always talk about when we do uh, presentations about experiment design. That with humans, you need, to give the, you need to give the information back in some way that's understandable. I know that there are protocols to, that you're supposed to do this. But in practice, it's very rare, especially in the developing world. So uh, a couple months after we, we got this, we actually worked with a uh, specialist to design this sheet. So it's understandable, at least to people of a particular grade level, 
bright, it has colors, that basically tells them their level in a graphical way. How bad is that with color schemes? They told us what fish they ate. We told them what we found in their fish. It compares them to the standard. It compares them to their community. Gives them a lot of information in a small in one sheet. Plus, we give them some side information you know, for reference. But this has really uh, changed the discussion, especially when we're giving this to 1% of the population of a state that has a mean mercury level three times the level that should be acceptable. This has actually created a lot of ground level pressure, political pressure. There's a lot of concern in the healthcare uh, community because the doctors had no idea how to, you know, what mercury was. There was still a lot of kind of old wives' tales. Um, they didn't have any spe specific training. There was nothing. They just knew it was there. And if somebody said, do I have mercury? They're like, well, maybe. I don't know. Right? So now people are saying they're going with their piece of paper going like, what is this? It's not saying that this is the answer. But they're like, explain this to me. Why hasn't somebody talked, to, uh, talked about this? So it's actually created a very interesting social dynamic. Um, and it's resulted in uh, uh, campaigns. This is from the Ministry of Environment um, that's using our data and, and other people that are doing this uh, to have these, these uh, they have a hashtag for the city people, but also they're really trying to push this uh, by having a lot of this kind of campaign in schools and in the TV, the local TV, to do something. Um, and then also they are starting to have events. This is between the Ministry of Environment and the Ministry of Health, where they have games for kids, where they uh, you know, tell them to pick out which is the best fish. Um, this is in the center of, the, of the, the capital of the region. They even go into the mining areas where people that usually are a little resistant to this are kind of shown this information. Um, so it's, it's starting something at least. Um, not sure how it's going to end up, but the data is being used. And of course, I should mention that last year there was the Minamata Convention on Mercury that finally recognized uh, uh, in a formal and very high level that mercury is, uh, is a massive problem. 97 countries have already signed to, the, to this uh, international treaty to reduce and eventually ban mercury use completely in 2020, uh, 2022. Um, so the US is the only uh, country that has ratified this, actually. So 97 have signed. The US has ratified it, which is great because the US generally doesn't ratify international environmental treaties and things that they should. But uh, they did it immediately, uh, which was, I think, a really good step. Um, but we'll see how that goes. Um, and I'll leave you with a picture that I hope that one day uh, I'll be able to return in some of these areas and see. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of work to be done for those that are interested in, in doing work. It's a very interesting place. Uh, and there's uh, a lot of interesting work to be done now in restoration ecology. Um, currently in this region, uh, the government of Peru has started a process that they call saneamiento, which means cleaning. They actually set a deadline for miners to stop activities and join the formal economy. Uh, this was uh, April, 12, uh, April 20th, and now they are in the process of literally pulling people out. It's, invol it's involving military. They're now putting hundreds of millions of dollars to, to create sustainable or alternative livelihood projects. It's a very large undertaking. Uh, and it's going to transform the region socially, for sure, economically, but also um, some of these areas are not going to recover as fast as they should. Many of these areas are going to be very contaminated. So there's a lot of not only work for understanding the problem, but for remediating and understanding the dynamics of how to restore areas that are likely to be developed by people. Because you know, a lot of these miners, if they're made not to be miners anymore, they have to do something. So that's going to be the big question of how that's going to go. So. Well, thanks very much. These are some of the folks I work with, and I appreciate your interest. Questions, sir?